Thank you. So, um, yeah, so I made a little bit of change in the title because um, I was initially going to talk about uh, ultrafast demagnetization in uh, transition metal alloys, but um, I think uh, I will focus more on uh, what we can do at Helios. So, and then it's not it's not only alloys I will talk about. So, I'm, I'll try to minimize uh, this one. Small, yeah. So, um, yeah, I will start with. Um, Um, describing a little bit about um, ultrafast demagnetization. I'm sure most of you have heard of it and uh, know a lot, maybe a lot about it, but um, uh, if you go back to 1996, um, it was first found uh, using an uh, ultra short laser, uh, laser that uh, you were able to demagnetize nickel uh, in a couple of hundred femtoseconds. Uh, which was uh, a bit of surprise since uh, magnetization is uh, angular momentum and it needs to be conserved. So um, that it happens so at these fast timescales was uh, a bit surprising. Uh, today, um, uh, there is um, quite some uh, understanding now of how it works. And um, this is a nice schematic of um, uh, the general, um, processes that occur during the demagnetization. So when you come in with a laser pulse, you excite electrons and uh, usually you have an, uh, a laser pulse of maybe uh, one EV, one and a half EV photon energy. So you basically can excite electrons uh, one and a half EV above the Fermi level. And uh, during this time, uh, you um, can also have um, coherent interactions between the spin and photons, uh, but we will not go into that. Um, so during the first uh, couple of hundred femtoseconds, uh, one has seen by photoemission that um, you start off with a electron distribution that is not uh, a Fermi Dirac distribution. And it takes a few hundred femtoseconds because, uh, before it uh, thermalizes through electron scattering and you start to get some kind of a electron temperature out of it uh, in a Fermi direct distribution. Um, and then during this time, you will start to demagnetize. And uh, generally it's believed that it happens uh, through two different processes, either through a spin flip scattering, or you could also have uh, super diffusive spin currents. So basically that the uh, majority spins are uh, leaving the uh, are not flipping, but they are actually leaving the the probe area. That you're, yeah, the area you're probing. And then uh, at a little bit longer time scales, you will also have uh, uh, thermalizations between uh, the electron and the phonon uh, systems. So, um, and then at even longer time scales, uh, the heat uh, goes away through thermal diffusion. So you will have uh, uh, fast demagnetization and then uh, in a nanosecond or so you completely uh, go back to the original magnetic state. So um, this uh, measurement done in the 96, it was uh, pump probe using both um, uh, pumping with um, optical light and probing with optical light. So at Helios we are, um, using high harmonic generation to generate um, higher photon energies. So, um, and we do this by uh, having a intense, uh, well, laser amplifier, uh, which gives uh, intense laser pulses, which we then focus into gas. Generally it's um, uh, helium gas. Uh, we used to use neon, but uh, it has been difficult to get hands on lately. So um, when you do this, you, um, when you focus the uh, laser pulse into the gas, you, uh, you will generate a very strong electric field, which uh, makes it possible for electrons in the atoms, uh, gas atoms to um, tunnel out from the atoms and then accelerate inside this electric field. And since it's an uh, oscillating electric field, uh, 
some of the electrons uh, make it back to the parent atom that they uh, initially left. But they will have uh, high kinetic energy returning. So they will, uh, and this energy will then be uh, emitted as uh, either an X-ray or uh, uh, extreme ultraviolet uh, light. In our system, we are um, generating uh, photons between 20 and 100 eV. Uh, but we use filters so we are, uh, that uh, basically stops light above 72 EV. So that's uh, generally what we are limited to. And the high harmonics that are generated, they are, um, have the same properties as the initial laser pulse. They, have, they are probably a little bit shorter. So the initial laser pulse is around 30 femtoseconds. Uh, we estimate that the uh, harmonics are around 20, 25 femtoseconds. And um, it's uh, also coherent, spatially and temporally. So uh, in 2000, uh, so one of the main reasons we want to use high harmonics to study uh, ultrafast immunization uh, can be illustrated by this experiment that was done in 2012. So this was a bit before we uh, even started um, uh, being able to do experiments at Helios. Uh, and um, what they used, uh, they used a similar high harmonic source and they measured uh, permaloy. And since they are able to uh, use higher energies, they are able to separate the iron and the nickel in permaloy. And what they found is um, that there seems to be a small delay between the iron and nickel demagnetization, but it's, uh, it's pretty small. So uh, then they uh, alloyed this with copper and they actually could see a very large difference in the demagnetization between iron and nickel. And the interesting thing is that um, they tried to use phenomenological uh, fittings to this and uh, their uh, conclusion was that uh, you're basically demagnetizing the iron only. And um, while the nickel is just demagnetizing through its uh, exchange interaction with the iron. And uh, so we have done studies on this, uh, on iron nickel alloys uh, to try to understand this uh, a bit further, but um, I will not discuss those results today. I will talk about other things. So, we use um, something called transverse magneto-optical care effect to do the measurements. And um, we, uh, we measure something called a symmetry parameter. So we basically, uh, the main uh, thing with TMO compared to other uh, MOC geometries, like uh, longitudinal MOC or uh, polar MOC, is that uh, you're actually not uh, measuring the polarization of the light. Uh, in the other geom geometries, you're measuring how the polarization of the light changes, uh, which gives you information about the magnetic state. TMOC, uh, on the other hand, doesn't change its polarization, uh, but it changes the, uh, the, the reflectivity. And um, with some um, approximations, one can show that the symmetry parameter is proportional to uh, the off diagonal component of the dielectric tensor, so epsilon xy. And uh, then it's an, um, uh, one can also make the approximation that uh, epsilon xy is proportional to the magnetization. So if, yeah. So I will uh, now show you how the experimental, uh, how the laser system looks like. So um, we have, First, um, the oscillator that gives us the short pulsed uh, laser pulses. And then we have an amplifier. Uh, and then uh, we split up the beam, uh, the laser pulses. Uh, one becomes the pump beam that demagnetizes the sample. And then we have a probe beam. So about 80% of the light is then sent into the probe beam. And then the probe beam is focused into a high harmonic uh, gas cell where the high harmonics are generated. 
After that, we have a monochromator where we could, if we wanted, uh, pick out specific harmonics. But in our uh, system, we, we um, use a mirror. So we want all the harmonics to get through. And then we have a collimator chamber where we basically uh, put the pump beam and the probe beam uh, following the same path uh, to the sample. And we focus the, the beams on the sample then. And then the beam is reflect, uh, reflected at uh, 90 degrees. Uh, and then uh, we measure the spectrum uh, with the spectrometer. And um, here is a typical, uh, uh, on the top left, there's a typical image of how it looks like, where you can see the different high harmonic uh, uh, energies that are measured with the CCD camera. So, the first uh, system I will talk about that we have measured here uh, is uh, half metallic uh, cobalt iron aluminium Hoysle alloy. Uh, so the Hoysle alloys uh, are interesting because they have um, they can show a gap in the one of the spin channels at the Fermi level. So um, basically make it thing, making it a hundred polar hundred percent spin polarized, uh, giving a hundred percent spin polarized current. And they also have uh, high QE temperatures. So, and the specific alloys that we have uh, looked at is uh, then the cobalt-based uh, Hoysle alloy, which uh, where you can have different, uh, uh, several different elements uh, in it. So, I iron, manganese, and aluminium, and silicon. And uh, what's interesting with this system is that um, you can, uh, you basically have. Um, uh, three different sublet systems, so um, we call them X, Y, and Z. So if you have a perfectly ordered uh, system, we call it L21. Then the red atoms are complete uh, are occupied by the cobalt atoms, and the blue are uh, well, the green are occupied by the iron atoms, and the blue is then uh, occupied by the aluminium atoms. But then you can also also have some disorder in the system, and uh, a B2 or this B2 dis disorder. You are mixing up the, the iron and the aluminum atoms, so which is shown by the green atoms here. But the cobalt is still uh, occupying the same uh, sublattice that it was uh, for the L21 order. And then you can have a even more uh, higher disorder, where you, which you call A2 disorder, where all the atoms are uh, completely disordered, the cobalt and the iron and the silicon. And this you can control uh, by the growth temperature uh, of the samples. So we measured on uh, four different samples uh, grown at uh, three different temperatures. So about 300 Kelvin, 600 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin and 800 Kelvin in about that order. And here I also show the structure that in how the sample structure looks like. So we have an aluminum capping uh, on top of the CFA sample. And the capping is important that it's uh, uh, thin enough for our um, high harmonics to be able to probe it, uh, the sample beneath it. And it also needs to protect the sample from oxidation. So here's a typical spectrum of um, uh, one of the samples. Voltage samples, where we can clearly see uh, how the symmetry uh, looks like at the uh, absorption edge of cobalt at around just below 6 TeV. And then we have the absorption edge of iron uh, just below uh, around 53 EV then. So now if we uh, do a pump probe on this, uh, these samples, uh, we can look at first look at the um, sample grown at 300 Kelvin. So that's the one that um, uh, we have seen by X ray diffraction that it actually has a uh, completely disordered phase, so a, a two phase. And what we see is that the demagnetization, so, uh, which we have is zoomed in on the, uh, in the figure here, that um, there is a little bit difference between iron and cobalt, but uh, when we do the fitting, we see that it's uh, well, kind of within the area bars um, uh, of the samples, and it doesn't really change between the samples. 
what is turns out to be more interesting in this study is uh, the remagnetization part. It's not uh, clear from these figures. Uh, I will show you the fitting results soon. But as you go from the A2 phase at grown at 300 Kelvin to the 600 Kelvin uh, sample, uh, which turns out to have about 90% about B2 phase. Uh, the remagnetization um, becomes slower. And uh, if we now look at the next two samples, we have the uh, six, 700 Kelvin sample, which uh, also turns out uh, to be about the same order as the sample grown at 600 Kelvin. So about 90%. Uh, and then we have the sample grown at uh, about 800 Kelvin, which shows uh, almost a pure B2 phase. So that's the most, uh, most ordered structure that we have between of all these samples that we, we measured. So um, in also in this case, uh, it turns out that the, uh, the remagnetization part is the more interesting. And uh, if we now look at the numbers uh, after doing the fitting, we can see that uh, the demagnetization uh, within the error bars that it kind of stays at the same value for the all, all the samples. And um, while the remagnetization, uh, as we go up in um, growth temperature, uh, so it, the x-axis here is now plotted with uh, uh, as as the two different samples uh, with ninety percent B2 order, but they also follow the the, the growth temperature on the x-axis. So um, you can clearly see that it uh, the remagnetization go time goes up uh, quite a lot. Now we also did some uh, theoretical calculation um, uh, during atomistic spin dynamics uh, for different uh, orderings. And uh, what we see is a similar type of behavior where the, um, we can see that the remagnetization time goes up from two picoseconds up to four picoseconds, uh, similar to what we see from the experimental uh, measurement. Now the spin dynamics, uh, so we can see that there is a good agreement. So in the uh, simulation, what determines the, uh, the remagnetization time is uh, partly the exchange interaction, the, mag the magnetic moments, and also the damping. Uh, for this, what's interesting with these samples is that the exchange interaction and the magnetic moments don't change very much. However, the damping do. So we uh, this uh, change in the uh, Remagnetization time cannot uh, is believed to be uh, mostly determined then by the damping, and uh, we can see how the damping changes from calculations uh, as we change the ordering, and it goes from uh, about uh, two to the power of minus three down to zero point four to the power of minus three. So quite a lot change going from A two order to B two order. Uh, so these are calculated values then. And this uh, is believed to be connected to um, how the density of chain, density of state changes at the thermal level. So if we zoom in at the thermal level, we can see that um, the density of states is pretty high for the A2, the fully disordered system, uh, but it uh, decreases as we uh, increase the ordering of the sample. Um, and um, here we compare the, the remagnetization time obtained from the spin dynamic uh, simulation uh, compared to the uh, calculated damping. And we can see that they kind of follow the same trend. And if we now plot, uh, uh, instead plot the calculated damping um, to the experimental uh, uh, remagnetization time, so basically the inverse is the uh, remagnetization time. We see that they again follow the same uh, kind of trend. So the faster, the higher the damping you have, uh, the faster uh, the remagnetization occurs. Uh, 
Now, the damping, uh, we are not only limited to the calculated values of the damping. The damping can be also obtained from uh, ferromagnetic resonant measurements, which has been done on these samples. So, um, and they are plotted here as the purple triangles and, uh, and uh, plotted on the left axis. So is the theoretical damping, uh, which is the yellow curve. And then on the right side, we have the uh, remagnetization time obtained from the experiment. And we can so see from um, how, that there is a very nice correspondence between the uh, calculated damping and uh, uh, remagnetization time. So, um, yeah, so a summary of these uh, measurements is that uh, the demagnetization time does not seem to change very much as we change the structure, uh, structural ordering. However, the remagnetization time uh, increases as the structuring ordering increases for both iron and cobalt, and also that it follows the Gilbert damping uh, for this uh, kind of material. So, Can I ask how much time I have left? Sorry, um, about 15 minutes, so just go ahead. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, then I'll go to the next part. So the first part, uh, what, I, what I wanted to, uh, experimentally I wanted to mainly show uh, the main advantage of using uh, high harmonics compared to um, optical light is that you can uh, get this separation of the uh, demagnetization between iron and the cobalt, which you cannot get uh, uh, using optical light. So another advantage that we have with this system, the high harmonic system, is that um, uh, it can be illustrated by this slide. So here I show the iron reflectivity on the top left for uh, two different magnetization directions. So this is now a pure iron sample. And uh, below it, I plot the um, iron asymmetry. And um, where you can clearly see this um, uh, main absorption asymmetry uh, just below 55 EV. But you can also see that there is um, uh, an asymmetry for many for several energies above and below it. Same goes for a pure nickel sample. So we have the main asymmetry as a, at about uh, 67 EV. And then we can see that there is uh, asymmetry as well uh, at energies far below it. And then I also show here a demagnetization, a typical demagnetization of the pure iron and the pure nickel measured at the main, uh, main uh, absorption peak. So we can use this uh, by investigating. Uh, uh, so I, I will go back one step. So we are we are using this uh, to study the magnetization by the assumption that I mentioned before, that um, the symmetry is proportional to epsilon x y, which we assume is proportional to the magnetization. And uh, we can do this assumption uh, because first we assume that the epsilon xy is pretty small. Uh, so it's, then we can assume that it's proportional to asymmetry. And we also assume that uh, epsilon xy is proportional to the magnetization, but this requires us to assume that the band structure is independent of the magnetic configuration. So, how it, it turns out that uh, the first assumption is um, pretty valid in our case. So I will not go into that at all. So, but the second assumption can actually give us uh, some new information. So to compare, so we will uh, compare our um, measurement of the symmetry uh, to the symmetry obtained from theoretical calculations. And uh, for a static measurement, uh, we show here for iron on the left and nickel on the right. 
And what you can see that um, the data points, the red and the blue are from uh, our experimental data points of the asymmetry. And the black line is then uh, theoretical calculations. And we can see that it, uh, there's a pretty nice correspondence between the uh, theoretical and the experimental values that we get, both iron and for nickel. Now, if you want to um, see what happens with the theoretical asymmetry during demagnetization, um, I'm sorry, I will go back one step. So uh, if you now look at the experimental demagnetization of nickel, uh, we can see first here the, how the demagnetization looks like for, uh, for nickel at the absorption edge, uh, the main absorption uh, peak. If we now see how it changes, how it looks like for the other energies, we see that for 63V, it doesn't really change. It's, uh, all of the energies are pretty much following the same type of demagnetization curve. Now, if we take a look at iron, we see a completely different picture. So this is the main uh, absorption peak, the demagnetization of that. And if you now look at the harmonic above it, we see a very strange behavior. It, the symmetry seems to increase and then go down. And if we look at some other energies, go up one more step, uh, we also see a, a little bit of uh, uh, strange behavior and then you can see that uh, the other energy below it as well. So at um, close to the demagnetization, we see a very uh, uh, different behaviors for different iron energies. Now, we believe this could can be explained by looking at the different type of uh, type of excitations that you can have in these materials. So you can have either stoner-like excitation, where you have the magnetic moment uh, is uh, the length of the magnetic moment is decreased. Uh, so this can be do, done by constraining the DFT calculation to, to a specific magnetic moment. And then we can also have uh, a long wavelength magnetic excitation. So in our case, we are assuming uh, basically infinitely long magnetic excitations. And then we can also have short wavelength magnetic excitation. And in our case, we have uh, done this by having random orientations of the magnetic moment, uh, which corresponds then to short wavelength magnetic excitations. So now what we want to do is to um, investigate theoretically what, how does it uh, affect uh, the symmetry uh, when you uh, demagnetize by these different types of excitations. So if we start with the theoretical result of nickel, we can see that um, a symmetry actually uh, follows uh, the same trend for all types of um, excitation. And it turns out that it's more or less proportional to the amount of uh, demagnetization. So the symmetry seems to be uh, proportional to both epsilon xy and the, uh, and the magnetization for all types of excitation in nickel. So this is very similar to what we saw for the experiment. We see basically no, no change in the uh, in the energy dependence of the symmetry. So now if you look at the iron, the theoretical results of iron, we see a completely different behavior. So for the stoner excitation, uh, we see a very nonlinear behavior, uh, as you can see here uh, within this circle. And this is for uh, a stoner excitation, basically, decrease, yeah, you decrease the magnetic moment. For the long wavelength magnons, it becomes, uh, we see a complete, uh, completely proportional behavior between uh, the magnetization and the asymmetry. And for the short wavelength, we are in a situation that's kind of in between the stoner-like and the long wavelength uh, situation, where we see a, a relatively proportional behavior, but we also see a portions where we see a strong nonlinear behavior. So with this, I will um, 
end uh, with, uh, with the summary. So um, for the iron, we see, we see that there is a strong energy dependent asymmetry close to the demagnetization. Um, and the remagnetization, uh, we see that it's kind of uh, not energy dependent, which would suggest that we are for the remagnetization part of the, de uh, of the demagnetization curve. We see, we can assume that it's um, likely uh, longer wavelength magnons, while at the initial demagnetization, we, are, we are probably have stoner-like or uh, very short wavelengths uh, that are uh, contributing uh, right at the demagnetization onset. And for the nickel, uh, we see that all the models uh, seems to be uh, give a proportionality between the asymmetry and the magnetization. Uh, when it comes to nickel. So it's uh, for nickel, we can't really say much because, uh, the, yeah, the theoretical modeling is simply inconclusive uh, in this regard. And uh, so we have studied iron nickel. Uh, so I want to point out in the last point here that um, Gila team has also done uh, measurements for cobalt, uh, which turns out to be a, a case that is a kind of in between the nickel that doesn't show any difference, energy difference, uh, dependence, and iron that shows a very large one. And um, yeah, with this, I would like to end. <laughs>